So this is Nancy at Sipping and Painting Hamden, and today we're going to be doing this painting called Winter Bliss. And we are using acrylic paints today, as we usually do. And I only need four colors in this painting. Um, and so I have them on my palette. My blue was really watery, so it kind of ran all over the place. But basically, it's red and blue as the color colors, and then black and white uh, as the neutrals. And um, yeah, so it's a pretty simplistic color palette, uh, but I think it's really lo lovely and I hope you enjoy painting it too. So the first thing we're gonna do <clears throat> is, uh, and we'll also be using napkins and a water jar. So you should have some water in your jar or cup or container, whatever you're using. And then if you'd like to, Sip with me. I, I'm going to be drinking tea, but you're welcome to sip whatever you like for your paint and, and sip experience. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to use a big brush and I'm going to pick up water and I'm going to put water all over my canvas. The reason I'm doing that is in Denver, it's very dry. And so I want to keep my canvas hydrated so that the paints don't dry too quickly. I don't think I'm gonna have a lot of trouble with that blue drying too quickly, but um, just in general, we wanna keep the paints um, thin enough that they're not really gloppy. We want them to, to move freely across the canvas. So we're just gonna keep the canvas hydrated by adding a little bit of water ahead of time. If you were in uh, a humid place like I don't know, Louisiana or Miami or, you know, some island somewhere, you probably wouldn't have to do this step. But in Denver and the West, it's very dry. So we do have to keep our canvases moisturized with a little water. All right. So I'll give you just a moment to, to do that. One other thing I wanna tell you about this painting, um, we have about 500 different paintings in our gallery at our studio and about a hundred of them hanging on the walls in here. Uh, and each one was painted by a different artist and uh, used a different color palette. So when we are using our primary colors, we're trying to approximate the colors in here, but just so you know, with um, using uh, primary colors, we won't always get exactly the right color. So for example, this may be a different shade of pink than we're gonna make, and this might be a different shade of purple than we're gonna make, but we're gonna get close, close enough. Um, it won't look exactly like this. Mine won't look exactly like this. Yours won't look exactly like mine, but it doesn't really matter. They're still gonna be beautiful and no one will ever see the original. Um, they'll just see yours and they're gonna think that you're amazing. You're an amazing artist. So just be prepared. The colors might look a little bit different. All right, so when I'm painting an acrylic painting, I generally like to start with a background. And in that, this case, it would be the sky. So I'm actually going to pick up a little white on both sides of my big brush. I'm not scooping it like ice cream, but it's just clinging to the brush. And I'm gonna put it about a hand span up. And you can do crisscross curls, strokes or circles or, you know, X's, infinity symbols, you, you decide. It doesn't really matter. I'm just applying some white paint in this area, which seems kind of silly because our painting is gonna be white, but it's just giving me a base so that when I put on some pink, it's gonna blend really nice. Then I, I'm not gonna clean my brush in between this step and the next one. I'm gonna take my white, a little white paint, and I'm gonna put it off to the side. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of my red paint, and then I'm gonna stir that in. 
to make pink. Now I want to start out with a light shade of pink. So use more white than red. We want it to be light. And if you end up making it dark, that's okay. Well, you can just put it a little higher on the canvas. So once I have some paint uh, mixed, you'll notice that this area is darker pink than down here behind the mountains. So I'm gonna look at, well, this is still fairly pale, so it probably goes in around here, somewhere around here. But if yours is darker than mine, if it uh, has more red in it, then you can start a little higher. And I'm just doing crisscross strokes because I wanna keep that background wispy. So to go lower, I'm just gonna pick up some more white and I'm gonna let it blend in with that pink on the bottom. And I'm not making smooth strokes. I'm letting it be choppy. I want it to be choppy like a wispy wintry day. Almost, we're almost giving the impression with these messy strokes that it's almost like we could see the wind. So I have the pink I started with. And then down here, it's a little whiter. Since this is my mid-tone of pink, this is my lighter shade, this is my mid-tone, I'm gonna pick up a little bit more red and mix it in with the pink I already had to go above this pink. So it's gonna, this color is gonna get more intense as it goes up. So now this new shade that I'm making should really be like the color of Pepto-Bismol or a Candy Heart. It's, it's, a, it's a hefty pink. And again, choppy and wispy. And then I'm gonna blend it in a little bit with what's underneath, just so you can't really see where one starts and one stops. And by blending it, I mean overlapping. So this is a little warmer pink than that one. This is a cooler pink. It just depends on the kind of paint, the brand of paint that you use. Um, we have about 10 shades of red here at the studio and we have about 10 shades of blue. So it's not exactly the same every time, but that's okay. It's still gonna look great. And then I can add a tiny bit more red to that and just put a little bit more up in here, a little bit more intense. So in general, what we've done is we've gone from lightest, from white to lightest to darkest pink. Mm -hmm. 
we're going to do the same thing with purple, but we're going to have to mix a couple colors to get purple with white. But it's the same general idea. It'll be light and then it'll go darker up to blue. In just a moment, I'll show you how to do that. All right, so after we get that pink on, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up, I'm gonna make a new pile. I'm gonna use some white and I'm gonna pick up that pink that I made before. And then I'm gonna pick up some blue. I don't wanna use all my white. I don't wanna use all my blue. I just wanna mix a little at a time. Don't use all your red. Just mix a little at a time so that you can, if you don't like it, you can throw that away and you'll still have enough paint to continue. So what I'm gonna mix now is a lavender. It's a little white, a little blue, and a little red. I, I'll definitely need more white than the colors. More white than red and more white than blue. And I'm gonna keep going back and forth between those colors until I get into adding just a little bit extra at a time until I get something that looks like a light lavender. Like a light purple, very pale purple. And then I'm gonna take that very light lavender and I'm going to Put it over, notice how I'm not even letting those colors really dry completely. I just keep working it. And the reason I'm doing that is that way, if it's a little bit wet, it still blends, it blends nicely. Some people will tell you, you can't blend colors with um, acrylics, you can only mix them. But I don't think that's true. I think you can blend. You just have to do it while your paint's still a little wet. So notice how I have this layer of lavender and now my brush is pretty dry at the top, but since my bristles are dry, but still a little dirty with that lavender, I can just come down into the pink a bit and just blend that. So you can't exactly tell where the pink starts and the lavender stops. And then as I go up, I'm gonna add more blue and more red in this area. So both more color, so it intensifies the purple. And again, when I mix colors, I, I always try not to take too much. I wanna keep some of it in case I need to paint over anything. Just mix what I think I'll need and no more. I learned that the hard way. Sometimes you, if you mix the whole pile, then you run out of paint, you can't keep going. All right, so I've got a little more intense purple. I'm gonna keep adding blue to that as I go up higher. And I'm not putting on in straight ribbons or bands. I'm being kind of messy. And then at the tippy top, it's gonna to be just plain, plain old blue.
And I'm going to go around the top of the canvas as well. Just painting even at the top and on the sides. Now, I don't want it to look like straight lines. So when my paint starts to get dry on my brush a bit, I'm gonna use that dry brush to try to mix things up a bit by doing crisscross strokes that are overlapping the layers because I don't want anything to look too uniform because the sky looks pretty mixed up usually. I mean, it's keeping most of those colors in the right places, but it's breaking it up a little bit so it doesn't look like it's stacked. So when I do that, I get a little purple in my blue, I get a little pink in my blue, my purple, just kind of mixing it up a bit. And I'm gonna keep adding more blue to the top as that dries, because I want the intensity at the top and in this in both corners to be much more intense. That's gonna balance out the heaviness of these trees. If I have this top part really solid blue, gives the painting a little more balance. And it also brings your eye down to the brighter parts. And here and there, you might want to put a little more vibrancy somewhere. And then blend it in. You can, if you don't like it, something that you did, you can always let it dry and then go over it with more white. With, uh, so let it, let it dry and then you paint it over it with white when it's dry and then use the white like correction fluid and then paint over it. So I'm just trying to mess it up a bit so it doesn't look too much like layers. But if you might not wanna do what I'm doing at this point, you might wanna just take it slower and easier on your own. I'm just trying to mess it up a bit so it's not too stacked too predictable. I still want it to go light pink to darker pink and then light lavender to darker lavender to blue. I still want that. But it should have some unexpected surprises here and there, just like a real sky would. little blotch of color from another level. Maybe a little bit more blue on the sides and more pink in, in the center. And I'll, when this dries, I'll keep adding more solid blue up at the top. I want it good and solid up there. I'm not getting the brightness of the purple. Um, I think in this original, they may have used some fluorescent. Uh, I don't have that, but I still think I'm gonna like the painting. Like I said, we have 500 paintings. We probably have 10 different tubes of, 10 different colors of blue here. We have uh, phthalo blue, cerulean blue, primary blue, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue. This isn't an ultramarine. Um, and then we have probably another 10 different shades of red. And so, um, you know, when you're mixing, you don't always get the same thing twice. That's okay. That's how happy accidents are born.
And by not over blending it, I'm letting these, these kind of blotchy streaky areas happen. And it does, when I do that, it does create a little more visual interest up there. And it kind of suggests some clouds that are floating by. So you can add a little bit of white and then just kind of blend it in with crisscross strokes to suggest a cloud or two. That's kind of fun. So if you've ever seen a Monet or Van Gogh up close, they, uh, they are impressionistic. This is an impressionistic painting. It, it's not supposed to be perfect looking. Um, and uh, Monet and Van Gogh's are very different than the realistic painters like Renoir. Um, and when they were painting, people said to them, you're painting, you know, your trees don't look exactly like a tree and your, you know, your flowers don't look exactly like flowers and you need to go back and perfect them and what you've done is just an underpainting. And what Monet said to his critics was, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not painting an exactly a, an image of a tree or an image of um, a cloud or an image of a flower. What I'm painting is your memory of that thing when you look away. So keep that in mind that ours are not going to look perfect up close. Um, and it's, it's easy to get frustrated if if it doesn't look exactly like the sample up close, but the way you tell is you walk back about five feet. And if you're painting, um, if you're, you're looking at it from five feet away, that's the viewing distance that you're, uh, the other people will be seeing your painting. And that's really where they're supposed to look their best is about five feet away. So don't expect them to look good up close. Mine almost never do. Uh, but just remember the proper viewing distance is about five to 10 feet away. If you were to go into any museum and put your nose in a canvas the way we're doing right now, the guard would get very nervous and tell you to step back um, because it's just simply not the proper viewing distance. So keep that in mind. Right now, mine looks really messy up close, but I'm gonna step back and see it from the proper viewing distance. So I bet I have a better idea if I wanna tweak anything. Before I do that, I'm just going to use the paint that's left on my, my brush a bit. Blend, blend, blend. I There's a fine line. You want to blend it a little bit, but you don't want to blend it so much that it's mud. You want it to be choppy and messy. You want it to be that way because then it really looks like clouds. Again, this is a brighter pink, but see how messy that one is? Very messy. And messy's a good thing in a painting. Mine's looking a little muddy right now, so I'm just gonna leave it alone and let it dry a bit. <clears throat> I didn't realize how that a magenta was a cooler red, pardon me, a warmer red, until I saw this really bright, cool paint next to it. But like I said, every painting is different and it's gonna be beautiful. Oops, had a spot there, tried to fix it with a brush, had glue on my brush, that's all right. Be sure you wash your brushes really well when you're finished. notice there's a little bit of brightness up on this side suggesting there's either that there's more light on this side just notice that so I'm gonna just use a little water and a little it's very diluted white paint because I use I dip my brush in water first and then picked up the tiniest amount of white paint and then I can just use that tiny bit of white paint and just work in a little bit of light on this side and by light, I mean 
diluted white. It helps brighten that up a bit. All right, I'm gonna step back 10 feet and see what I think. And I hope you will as well. All right, I'm gonna try something bold. I'm gonna to try to just, no, nope. uh, probably gonna regret this. I'm just trying to get a little bit more color This red just doesn't want to make a bright purple with that blue. I might be just painting over this. I'm experimenting at the moment. I'm just trying to get a little bit more color like they have. But this shade of red is not exactly what they use, so. And that's something, a little interest. Just have to make sure it's not, it's blended in a bit. I always tell people who come in to paint with me, if you're 80% happy, leave it alone because you might not get to that 90 or 100. Um, and if you're not 100% sure you can do something, you might wanna just not do it. Um, but I'm obviously taking a little bit of risk here. Let's try to add a tiny bit more color. But frequently I'll stop when I'm 80% happy because I know 80% happy is pretty good. And I don't always have a plan on how to get back beyond that. So sometimes stopping at 80% is a really great thing. I have to have a good plan to go, to go for something after I'm 80%. All right. Okay, I think I pushed my luck on that one, but I a little more texture in it now, and that's good. If you wanna take a break now, um, this would be a great time to do it if you need to um, let the dog out or get a, another glass of wine or use the restroom or something. Um, and when you're ready, just let me know and we'll jump in and do our mountains. And actually we don't have to let the whole sky, uh, we don't have to have it be perfectly dry before we do our mountains because our mountains are gonna be down here. Um, so if it's, you know, if it's wet up there, it really doesn't matter too much. All right, so we're gonna make these mountains here and we're going to need to, I took that purple glob that I had, that purple mess, and I just added to it some more blue because these mountains are mostly blue. They just have a hint, a hint of, purple, of red in them. They're, they're a purpley blue, but mostly blue. And then they have a little bit of white in it. So if you start with blue, then use a little white and a tiny bit of red. And again, you know, our blue might not be, you know, this, our purple might not be exactly what they have, but it, it doesn't really matter. 
All right, so this peak is about right here. So it's a, about a loose, uh, not an open hand span, but just a loose one. And then a really, really stretched open hand span from the bottom and then just loose from the top. So right about there, I think right about there. And I'm just going to, I'm gonna use a medium brush, but you could use any side if you wanna start with a small first, you can do that. And I'm going to make it wiggly, wiggly and not too steep, you know, uh, not a skinny triangle. Sometimes when people make mountains, including me, they make them a little too, um, little too skinny. And then I'm gonna take that brush and I'm gonna kind of divide it with a Harry Potter scarf. And then with this side, I'm just gonna brush down. And when I say a Harry Potter scarf, could you know, like a lightning bolt, it's just a part. It's like we're parting our hair, but we're parting the mountain there. And I'm not gonna fill this in yet because I'm gonna use that same color. I don't wanna alter it. I'm gonna use the same color to put another peak right over it, a shorter one. And I'm gonna do the same thing with a Harry Potter scar or a lightning bolt coming down the center. And I'm gonna take this pretty far down there and then be sure to paint the side as well. And I left this part open because we want to have one side lighter than the other. I mean, brighter. So I left this side open and this side open because it's going to be slightly brighter. So to make it slightly brighter, I'm just going to pick up a little white and I'm going to mix that into some of my purple that I just made. So it's just a slightly lighter shade. And then starting with the peak, I'll brush that in that space that I made before, starting with the lightning bolt or Harry Potter scar, whatever you, or hair part, whatever you, however you want to refer to that. And I'm just brushing over that in the direction that I would ski down if I were a skier on that mountain. So this side should look brighter than that side. That's what we're going for. That makes it stick out. It makes it look like there's more light on this side. Kind of look like the pyramids. I'm going to step back about 15 feet, make sure that my mountains look good or that I can live with them 80%. If I'm 80% happy, I'll probably like them tomorrow a little better than that. I have to laugh because when I make anything, 
I always make them large. And I, I chalk that up to, I grew up in a family of nine kids. And I think someone must have told me once, go big or go home. Uh, a part of that's gonna be covered with a ski slope, with a mountainside. So that'll be fine. But do get up and make sure that you like the shape of your mountains. What I find here at the studio is people will frequently make them too thin um, and then they look really steep and they just don't look real. Even though mountains are really tall, they're even the steepest ones, if you really look at them, they don't look that abrupt. Unless it's like the flat irons in Boulder, those are pretty, pretty jagged. Um, The Rockies, you know, usually are wider than they are tall from a distance. They look that way. But who knows? Maybe this is the Alps. Maybe it's, you know, the fjords in Norway. We don't know. It can be anywhere you want it to be. It's your painting, your world. We'll let these dry a bit before we uh, before we add a little bit of snowy highlights, okay? So this side should be lighter in color than this side. Light side, shady side, light side, shady side. <coughs> They kind of look like they're floating right now, but in a moment we're going to plant those mountains so they don't look like they're floating anymore. The way you plant your mountains is it's just fun. We're going to start right about here, which is right about here. So it's about halfway down the canvas. Make a little we're gonna put white on our big brush and then we're gonna go skiing. We're just gonna cover up the bottom of those hills. And then we're just gonna keep pulling down and just go skiing. That's fun. And then we're gonna to continue to paint on the sides as you, as you paint, paint on the sides too. Just go and skiing. Painting on snow and if there's pink under there, let it mix with the snow because snow has all kinds of reflective colors in it. So if I picked up any pink, great. If I pick up any blue, awesome. When I fill in the rest of the snow, I am going to deliberately put white, a lot of white on one side of my brush. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of blue with my other side, just a tiny bit. So about the size of half of a pea, and the other side is like a lima bean of white. And I'm just gonna use that blue to just help me define the mountain a little bit, and then I'll blend it in. I want the snow to have blue reflections in it and not just be stark white, but, it, but when I'm painting, I'm painting with mostly white. There was a lot more white on my brush than blue. And then real softly to blend it in, but don't over blend, don't make it all one shade of blue. Leave the streaks. Because the streaks just look like someone's being skiing or maybe there was an avalanche there. Maybe it's just the way the sun's hitting the mountain.
and my slope, my slope marks, my brush strokes should match the slope of that hill. So up here, the brush marks should go down. Just pretend you're skiing. And it just goes right over the base of those hills. I'm gonna come back in and deliberately put a shadow under my trees. So you don't have to worry about that now. I mean, we can put it in, but that's very deliberate. In fact, I can put it in now. I'll just take my little brush. makes a little bit of blue and a little bit of white so it's like a medium and then I can go in and first put a little shadow right here where there's going to be a tree and then here it would be right here a big diagonal shadow and that's just blue paint And then I'll just pull it across. I don't want to blend it in totally. I want some to be more streaky than others. But in general, I want it to look like it's supposed to be there. Sometimes to make it look like it's supposed to be there, I do this wiggle thing with my brush, like a scribbling motion. That gives me a slightly more random movement. All right, so that's my shadow that's gonna go underneath that tree. So we definitely have to let this stuff dry because everything's still a little wet. So let's take five minutes and let it dry. When you get it to where you're happy, let's just let it dry for five, okay? Okay, sounds good. I have to hit my hand and make myself stop painting. One thing I forgot to say is it's always a good idea to go five feet, five to 10 feet away and just look at it before you stop. And if there's anything you want to tweak, do it then and then let it dry. So I'm going to just tweak something. This slope looks more steep than the original. So, and I couldn't see that up close. I just, I just can't. I can, and then this is also a little more steep. So, I'm going to change the slope on that a bit. And the slope is just determined by the direction of my brush strokes.
Awesome. So um, let's go ahead and let's just um, put on our highlights on the sunny side of these background mountains. Basically, all I did was I cleaned my medium brush and then dip it in water so that it's wet, but then, you know, drip, uh, get most of the drips off, but we still want it to be a little bit wet. Don't dry it too well. Then I'm just gonna pop the very bottoms into some white paint, but I don't want it to be on thick. I want it to be on thin. I can still see the contour of the bristles because I just wanna come in with the very, very lightest touch and just tap on a little bit of snow in some taps and some streaks on the sunny side, on the, yeah, the bright side. And try to keep your, your streaks and your touches kind of random and have them go with the slope of that hill. I'm not sure why they didn't put them on the dark side, but I guess it just really emphasizes the sunlight on the light side. It's very little paint that I'm using. My brush is almost dry. I want to be careful not to co cover the, you know, background too much. Most of the background should still sh uh, show. At this point, my brush is dry and I'm just kind of messing it up so it doesn't look too uniform. Basically scribbles. And I noticed when I stepped back uh, before that this side of mine is a lot darker than theirs. So I can take this opportunity and just, um, if I need to lighten mine up, just touch a little bit lighter lavender and just, I'm just gonna lighten my dark side up a little bit because it was lighter than the other. It was darker than the original quite a bit. But if yours was, you know, great from the get-go, awesome, you're way ahead of me. It's funny how you can't see it when you're right up on it. All right, basically all we have to do now are happy trees and then we'll sign it and celebrate our painting. So for happy trees, I'm gonna take a flat brush and I've been using this flat brush a lot, but it's, it's very useful. So 
I'm going to keep using this flat brush. In fact, I'm going to sw switch to my big flat brush. And if at any time I need to switch to a smaller one, I'll have that handy. So it's just whatever size feels comfortable for you when you start doing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my flat brush and I'm going to put black paint on both sides, but I'm not going to scoop it like ice cream. I'm just going to chisel it on my plate. So it's on the bristles, but it's there's no clumps. My paint's my black paint's pretty thin. If yours isn't thin, you can add a few drops of water. But here's the flat side. Here's the skinny side. You can see there's no clumps, but there is paint on both sides. And this tree is pretty big. So it's going to be a closed hand from the top and a closed hand from the side on my canvas. You'll have to determine exactly where yours is, but it's pretty high up here in the sky. That's where it's going to start. So I'm going to tap on a trunk. And the reason I'm tapping and not sliding down a line is I don't want it to be perfectly straight. There are no straight trees in nature. There's no straight anything hardly in nature. Very rarely will you see a straight line in nature. So my, I reloaded my paint and then from the top of the point, the point where the top of the tree is gonna be from that point, I'm gonna jump down about a half an inch and I'm gonna start with just using the corner of that flat brush to tap on little baby branches, little baby branches. And then as I go down, I'm tap, tap, tapping a lot and I'm making more branches as I go, but notice how much I'm tapping. It's not just like this. It's tapping a lot to make these branches. And I don't wanna make it too symmetrical, too perfect on each side. So I might have two branches in the place of one on one side, um, you know, or where there's two branches, I might have three. Just, just uh, keep it so it's a little bit random, not too predictable and too perfect. We wanna keep it looking like nature and not like Disney World. Nothing wrong with Disney World, but sometimes things look a little fake. So we want this to be imperfect. And I'm always gonna add branches over the trunk, even if they're just little ones, because there should be more fullness in the center anyway. And I'm just gonna take my time and I'm just gonna tap on these br branches. And as I go down, notice how the tree is get the branches are getting wider. It's making that triangular shape that evergreens are known for. And if you see that skinny trunk, just tap over it so you don't see the trunk. We don't want it to look like a sparse fake Christmas tree, right? That tree should should be kind of, that trunk should be pretty hidden. The hardest part for me on doing this, I really love doing these trees, but the hardest part is remembering to think in clumps. The tree branches tend to grow together in clumps and not to make them too perfect and symmetrical. You don't want it to look like a ladder. So I might have two or three branches right up next to each other. And then I'm gonna take them all the way down to the ground where my trunk started. And the reason I'm gonna take them all the way down to the ground is that when you see a tree out in nature, out in the mountains, the grass grows right up to the bottom branches and no one has trimmed those bottom branches to mow underneath. So they just go all the way to the ground. It's not like if we saw this tree at, um, you know, Eisenhower Park or something, um, where they tr they mow to get underneath it, and they take off the uh, bottom. Or they take off the bottom branches to get their lawnmower underneath it. Is what I'm trying to say. So we want to make sure it's nice and full over the trunk, 
and tap on some more fullness over the trunk area. And then you also wanna make sure that the branches go all the way down to the ground. So I started with the big ones first. It doesn't really matter. I could have done the babies in the background. It doesn't really matter. But I am gonna put another one right next to it. And the other one is quite a bit shorter. It's gonna be, um, you know, on your canvas, probably be about the a fingers, finger shorter. On a 16 by 20, it's probably four or five inches shorter, four inches shorter. And I'm gonna put it right next to that one. And try as I might, my evergreens never look just like someone else's. But you know what, there's about a thousand different species of evergreens. And well, I made that up, but there's a lot. Um, and I know when I go down to Florida to take Bob Ross classes, I see totally different trees than we have here. The Southern evergreens look totally different than the Colorado evergreens. When I go back to Michigan, those look different still. Uh, Lake Tahoe's look different than Vail's. So just remember, it doesn't have to look like the original. I always tell myself that. Other people have other styles based on where they've traveled and the images they have in their head and how they paint. So I try never to compare myself too much to another artist. And again, remember, tap over the trunk for some fullness so you hide that trunk. And it doesn't look like I have a lot of paint because I don't have any big clumps, but there's, there's a generous amount of paint on my brush. Always make sure you have a good size point at the top with no leaves on it, no branches. And the reason for that is, is that the baby branches grow on the top of the trunks, but you can't see them because they're just so small. Always make my trees too big. So let me. And don't worry about the bottoms of the tree. We can come back in and paint some snow over the trunks. Um, you know, to put another hill right, right in over the trunks. So don't worry about the how it ends at the bottom. It'll be fine. And just take your time, there's no hurry. At least I'm not in a hurry.
So now we're gonna do this little baby tree, which has the trunk that I just put on with a, I'm using a very small detail brush. And then I'm gonna leave a point, a sharp point at the top, always leave a sharp point at the top. And then I'm gonna tap on the branches. And notice how I'm touching the side of my canvas with my pinky. If, if you have a dry spot, you can set your pinky there and it helps steady your hand. And I always wanna make sure that I tap in a little bit of more fullness over this trunk area so I can't see the trunk. Because the trunk would have branches coming out from one side and the other side and then behind it and then forward. So the only way to paint the ones that are coming forward or behind is to tap over the center, a little more fullness just right over the trunk. I hope that makes sense. So it's a lot thinner as it comes out on the sides than it would be over the trunk. And then there's same thing down here. There's, this is a teeny tiny baby tree, but there's three medium sized ones here. And so whatever brush you think will do the job to make three little trees off. And I'm gonna try to make, not make them, I'm gonna try to make them different sizes so they don't all look like carbon copies of the other. Again, I'm using my pinky, I'm just touching my pinky down to steady my hand and that's really helpful. Always leave a point at the top that doesn't have any branches on it because that's where those little baby branches grow. They're there, you just can't see them yet because there's little babies. So it's exactly the same technique as the big trees. It's just using a smaller brush and a little less detail because you don't need so much detail in a tiny little tree. And you can scribble a little tiny bit at the top of the snow as a shadow underneath the tree, but I, don't overdo it. Just a little, little extra dark line down there, just so the tree has a little shadow under it. We're gonna to have to let those trees dry before we put snow on the branches. And then it will really come alive. That's, that's exciting part to me. So 
So I'm, mine are still not dry and I really don't want to put anything wet over black. Uh, I don't want to put white, pristine white over black. Let's let these dry a bit more. But I do want to show you what, what we can do is we can pick up our uh, white paint with a little tiny bit of blue in it, just, just uh, you know, the snow color, and just paint over the, um, the snow, the bottom of the trunk, if we have a trunk showing, and just make it look like the snow mound just went right up and finished it off. Just depending on if yours needs that or not. And some nice white snow under there does kind of make it look like it's piled up. It's still got a little shadow, but it's also, you know, it's, it's both. It's got both things going on. And up here, I have my shadow in the wrong place for this tree. I put my tree on the top of the mountain and the shadow way down here. So that doesn't make any sense. I need to go in and fix mine. So um, just take a look at where you have your shadows that they actually are shadowing under a tree and not no particular reason, which I must have done. I guess what I'm saying is I have to think about where my shadows are and make sure they make sense. You know, and sometimes they're just snowmobile tracks or maybe some animals were frolicking there. We don't know. Make up any story we want. So there are three ways to know if your painting is still wet uh, that I can think of. One is if it's still shiny, if there are shiny spots, of course. So I can hold it up under a light, I can move it around and I still see some shiny spots on mine. And I'm sure you probably do as well. Um, and yeah. there's definitely shiny spots in my snow. So I wanna wait another way to know is you can touch a, a part of your canvas that doesn't have any paint on it and then compare that to the feel of the back. And if the back is cooler, then you know there is still paint drying. That's also especially useful if you paint with watercolors. Um, and then a third way, of course, is to rub it on somebody who walks in the room. And I don't recommend that during COVID, they get really upset. I have to tell that that joke every time I, I paint and then I'm waiting for someone to say, my kid did that actually, and you now have to pay for our, you know, our <laughs> clothes. <laughs> Hopefully not. I can go ahead and show you, your tree is less dry than mine probably. I can see some wet spots in mine, so I can avoid those. I only see two wet spots in mine. So I can go ahead and show you, but just don't do it yet, okay? Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pick up stark white, clean white on my, again, flat, flat brush. And then I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna tap on little globs of snow, but not on every single branch. I'm gonna do it on about half of the branches, maybe a third of them. And I'm also gonna extend the snow out farther than the actual branch. I'm not gonna cover the branches. I'm just gonna put it on some of them and I'm extending out a little farther. 
And also make sure there's a little bit, you know, in the trunk area too, because those were, would be the branches coming out toward us. But I want to deliberately leave a lot of that black because you have, uh, as Bob Ross would say, you have to have dark to see the light. You have to have that dark contrast for your snow to really pop and look beautiful. So it needs that all that contrast. So I just have to discipline myself to leave a lot of those black branches just plain. And the reason for that is that, you know, maybe there's been wind, maybe this snow happened a few days ago, or maybe there was a fierce wind during the night and some of the snow came off some of the branches, or, or maybe, Maybe a bear climbed the tree, we, we don't know. So if it, if it were freshly fallen snow in a blizzard, yeah, we'd probably put on a little bit more. But just a typical day when it's been snowing on and off up there, some of those branches are not gonna have snow on them. And I wanna make sure that I'm putting some on more diagonally and some more straight, I just need to, make it look a little bit random, just mix it up a bit. And I'm just tapping on with that medium brush. Avoiding any wet spots. If yours is still really wet, I would highly recommend just waiting. Mine was pretty dry actually. I was able to avoid the two little wet spots on mine. But for me, it's the discipline part is don't cover up all the dark. I have to think of that Bob Ross quote. Mine's still wet. Yeah, there's no hurry. I'm definitely not being neat or a perfectionist about the snow. That would get me in a lot of trouble if I did that. And the little ones are easy. It's just a few bounces down. It's really the stark um, contrast that really, I think really makes those trees pop out. It's about half as much white paint as you use dark or uh, black, so that's a good way to think of it.
I'm just making sure that I have uneven amounts of my snow and it doesn't look too symmetrical. I have to fight that urge to have symmetry. Just makes sense. Some would have some would have more snow on clumps than others. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you how to sign your name uh, when you are finished. I, I, it's okay if you're not, no, no worries, no hurry. But I like to just take a small pointy brush, a detail brush. You can pull it through any color you want, red or black or blue, whatever color you like. And then I just put my initials in the bottom right-hand corner. And that way someday when I see your painting in the Louvre or the Denver Art Museum, I'll know exactly who it is. <laughs> 